Good morning and welcome to To The Point. This week in Lansing, at long last, Republicans in the Senate and the House agreed on a way to fix the roads. It's a plan that Democrats don't like, but we sat down with the Speaker of the House, Kevin Cotter, and he said that after months and months of negotiation with Democrats, they simply couldn't come up with the plan. And as you'll hear later in this segment, he says he thinks it's because of politics. Here's the Speaker of the House. Mr. Speaker, you said something before we started that uh, I was happy to hear because it's really what this show was designed for. You said if you had time, you would go through uh, this roads package that passed this past week. So I want you to do that, but first, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Rick, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate this format that allows me to answer longer questions. We're getting questions all the time and about a 30 or 60 second right. uh, you know, opportunity to respond. So, you know, this roads package, this, this was a huge accomplishment uh, this week to get this package done. Uh, you know, this is an issue that has been in front of us for years and, and it only continues to get worse because we've been under investing in the roads. And we spent so much time debating first, what was the size of the problem? And then secondly, how we were going to get to that number, whatever that number was. And so finally what we said was, you know, enough is enough. You know, the fighting, the debating about the size of the problem, that's not productive. That doesn't get us any closer to a solution. So we can all agree that significant investment is needed. So let's make significant investment. Uh, the, the, the consensus was largely around 1.2 billion was the number that was needed. Some argue higher, some argue lower, but let's get significant. So we shot for 1.2. And, you know, I would really describe it as a, as a bell curve as far as you know, you had the tails out here that were thinner in number, and then you had the peak in the middle as far as where the members of the body were. Some saying all new revenue was needed, that you couldn't use any existing. Uh, others would say, you know, no new taxes or fees at all, do it all with what you have. But in the middle somewhere was that sweet spot. And so what we ultimately did was put forward a package that said, okay, let's split it down the middle. Half of it from existing resources, reprioritization. The other half from modest uh, increases in taxes and fees. And so this plan, I really feel we hit that sweet spot, not only because we got the support, but because we got uh, to a place where we paid a lot of attention to what, you know, we don't want to cause harm to people, but at the same time, the people are telling us with a loud voice to fix the roads. And so this package, it's a little bit of an increase on registration, a little bit of an increase on um, the cost of gas at the pump. And so to put that in perspective, uh, with registration, it's ba based on, as it always has been, on the value of the vehicle. So this is an increase that on the average passenger car, again, it's going to vary depending on the value of the vehicle, but the average passenger vehicle will have an increase of $20 a year. $20 a year. I'm not, uh, you know, saying that that isn't significant, but I'm saying that's something that I think is, is um, you know, something the public will tolerate. Uh, on the gasoline side, it's going to be an increase, again, when fully phased in, of $0.07 cents a gallon, 7.3 cents per gallon. But the most important part of this uh, plan was we fixed what was the fatal flaw of the 1997 plan. We're funding roads today under a plan, a formula that was 18 years old, passed in 1997. And the reason we have the problem that we do today was that when that plan was passed in 1997, it was never indexed for inflation. So the gas tax was 19 cents per gallon in 1997. It's 19 cents today. And so 19 cents, uh, you know, we've experienced some inflation, cost of materials, cost of labor has gone up, uh, and, and to compound it worse, vehicles are getting better fuel economy. By itself, that's a great thing, but when you have a formula that's uh, on the uh, gallon cost, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a good formula. So uh, what we did was we indexed it to inflation. So beginning out in year 2020, 2022, after we're fully phased in with a 1.2, then it'll be indexed for inflation going forward. And so the goal was to protect this formula uh, so that it will have a longer useful life and that we don't recommit the sin, I like to say, of the 97 plan. There is <clears throat> so much in that explanation, and I want to go through it a little bit, bit by bit. And I'm going to say some of the things that you know that you've heard from opponents of this plan, certainly from your colleague across the hall, Representative Grimal, was very critical, as was Senator Ananek. Those are the two Democratic leaders. <clears throat> to begin with, <clears throat> when the governor started talking about this, as he does with most things, he talks about it as a bipartisan approach. And I talked with him this week and he said, look, we met for months in quadrant meetings. We met and came up with plan after plan after detail after detail. And it even predates you being in leadership. He was having quadrant meetings with the last speaker. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about this. And he said at the end of the day, that wasn't going to work. It didn't work. You couldn't get everybody together. So you ended up largely as Republicans, both in the Senate and in the House, doing this plan on your own. How difficult does that make the overall 
I, I don't want to say sale. How, do, how does that change the perception of this plan because it wasn't as bipartisan as at least the governor would have liked? Well, you know, uh, the plan is being attacked and it's unfortunate. I want to go back to that, you know, kind of that timeline that you laid out because we did spend months this term, in addition to all of the pre previous time that was spent in previous sessions, trying to do this in a bipartisan manner. We had, um, you know, myself, the minority leader in the House, Senate Majority Leader, Minority Leader in the Senate, as well as the Governor and Lieutenant Governor sitting around the table for months working, I believed, in good faith. And I'm not a partisan person. I don't like to jump into the partisan attacks. But at the same time, I'm going to defend myself and I'm going to defend our caucus. I'm going to defend the process that played itself out here because what I am convinced of is all of that time was time wasted because we saw those negotiations blown up by the minority leader, Tim Grammel, in the House. And it was so unfortunate because it was blown up over an issue that we agreed from the outset of the talks. I'm convinced that that was an effort to run time off the clock. This has become so politicized that I believe the Democratic leader wants to use our inability to get a road plan done to clobber Republicans in the next election. And we said, you know what? It's unfortunate that we just wasted so much time, but we're not going to allow that to happen. The people put us here, they put us here in a majority, and they expected us to govern. And so we rallied together. Ultimately, it was all Republicans and one Democratic uh, member that stepped up, uh, Representative Harvey Santana from Detroit, who was able to get behind this package because he realized what this would do for Detroit. But unfortunately, um, you know, time was wasted and this is continuing to be politicized. You're seeing them attack this plan. They're attacking, and I'll share with you the attacks. I know you're going to too. They're, they're talking about the fact that this relies too much on existing resources and that there are going to be painful cuts as a result. And there aren't. I want to explain why. Another criticism has been that it's not getting money to the roads quick enough. Those two go hand in hand. What we did here was we tried to be very thoughtful. And so I talked about the fact that, you know, there's a little bit on registration, a little bit on gas, but we also didn't want to create a situation where there were going to have to be painful cuts because of this $600 million that we've reprioritized from the general fund. And so what we did is we said, okay, let's phase this in over a period of years. In this case, it will fully phase in 2021. And the reason we did that was because we look at projections all the time, forecast as to what the growth is going to be in the general fund. And provided those forecasts play out, there will be no cuts as a result, no cuts needed. However, I will offer, and I'll concede the point, that we will at some point, uh, it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when, have another economic downturn. If that happens during the phasing of this plan, there's going to be some need to uh, do some reprioritization. Make no bones about it. But the other reason that phasing was so critical is because if you look at now the period of years that we have been underfunding road construction in this state, there's been a natural con contraction of the road building industry, both in the public and private sector. So if we were to flip a switch and just inject $1.2 billion into that system, it's just simple common sense, supply and demand to common sense that we're going to drive inefficiencies because bid prices are going to go up. So we need to allow a period of years for the road building industry, both public and private sector, to respond, to acquire equipment, to be able to acquire and train employees. Uh, and this is a very responsible way of, of doing that, I feel. You look at the uh, budget that we just passed and we were able to put $400 million of additional general fund money in, into the system. So that we're in that budget now. The plan we just passed pairs up with it very nicely and we build from there and we get to a point of 1.2 protected against inflation. So this is very thoughtful. There's, there are not going to be draconian cuts as a result of this plan, but what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're going to get our priorities straight. Uh, we have a general fund and we have to prioritize that. I've felt for years my passion, my, my focus on what the functions and the priorities of state government should be are public education, K-12 education. We just passed the largest K-12 budget in the history of the state. Passed with 99, 99 votes. Democrats agreed that we got that right. You look at uh, public safety, we've made that a priority, in roads. You know, certainly there are other areas that are important to fund, but we need to get our priorities straight, and that's what this does, is it says we're going to take this $600 million after it phases in, and we're going to protect it, where it's statutorily protected to go to the roads. Up next, we'll talk with the Speaker of the House, Kevin Cotter, about the process of getting the roads deal done. If Republicans control the governor's office, the Senate, and the House, why did it take so long? That's next. To the point. Welcome back to To the Point. The roads in Michigan are a mess. That's pretty much the consensus of many drivers and a lot of politicians. 
And for several months, if not a few years, the governor and others have been talking about ways to fix the roads. Well, finally this past week in Lansing, Republicans voted on a plan they say will do just that. Democrats say they're not so sure. In fact, they're not sure at all. But the Speaker of the House, Kevin Cotter, talks about how and why that plan came together. Let's talk about the process a little bit. I know you're not going to tell me everything that happened, but this is an interesting process to watch because it is very easy from the outside looking in to say, well, wait a minute, there's a Republican in the governor's office over there, and there's a Republican majority of a supersize down in the Senate, and there's a Republican majority in the House. What took so long? Now, I know you were meeting in the quadrant meetings, but even at that, it took Senator Meekoff a few hours in the caucus on Tuesday morning, and it took you a few hours after that to come up with the 54 that you needed down here and the 20 that he needed down there. What, what makes that process as difficult? Not that that was a long period of time, but it, it, this has not been easy to get Republicans on board, I guess is what I'm saying. You know, and I think my hope is that the public will look at that, you know, that as you laid it out, and say, you know, that's the system working. And I hope would find some, some comfort in the fact that this isn't uh, you know, Republicans all thinking from one brain. We all have, uh, because we all happen to share one, one party, that doesn't mean that we all think the exact same way. We all have different feelings and different views and things that we want to incorporate into the plan. And I think that that's the beauty of the system. It ultimately makes the plan at the end better. Uh, but at the same time, we have to work it through. And so the governor had certain priorities, the Senate Majority Leader had certain priorities, I had certain priorities, and what we ultimately produced was a nice blend of those. Had the quadrant process worked, uh, and worked until the end. We could have had a blending of Democratic priorities in there as well, but that didn't work. Uh, so, you know, this, uh, it was very thoughtful again. And, uh, you know, another piece of it that we were able to get into the plan was some tax relief. And I think that tax relief is important because as I was talking about, um, you know, the impact on people, we wanted to be very sensitive. Even though the registration piece is, you know, not, not a huge amount, not a huge amount at the pump, we still wanted to offset that for those that were going to be impacted the greatest by it. And so what we did was we put $200 million into additional relief in what is known as the Homestead Property Tax Credit. Again, it doesn't apply just to homeowners, it applies to renters as well, but for low and moderate income, they're going to receive an increase uh, in, in the credit when the, when the taxes are filed. And for many groups, lower and mi middle income, they're going to experience a net tax cut. So while the registration fee is going to go up, the gas tax is going to go up, the amount of the credit that they're going to get as a result of uh, the, the tax return is going to exceed that and actually provide a net tax savings. So again, it's just another example of being thoughtful about this trying not to do anything that's going to harm people, but at the same time realizing that we've got to fix the roads. This was no question a very political issue, one that uh, may still be a political issue as you move into next year. Take the politics out of it for a minute. You've already laid out why you think this is going to work. Three years down the road, six years down the road, will people say Michigan roads are better than Ohio or better than Indiana because we've heard for years how much better the roads are in Indiana or Ohio. What is your confidence level that this is the answer? This is the answer. It's a question of how quickly we're going to notice it. And what I mean by that is that our neighboring states have done a better job than we have, frankly, for a long period of time in keeping their roads up. So I don't want to uh, try to mislead the public and say that, uh, you know, first year of this plan we're going to notice fresh black pavement everywhere because that's simply not the case. It's going to take some time to bring them back. These roads have deteriorated a long way. Uh, what's going to happen immediately is we're going to be able to start doing the maintenance that we should have been doing for years. Uh, you know, as I talk to local government officials in my area, they're saying we can't even do the preventative maintenance to, pro, you know, to slow down the rate at which these roads are, are degrading. So they're going to be able to do that. Uh, but then also, over time, bring these roads back. So it is going to take a period of years to, to really see that. But I think even just with the $400 million that we put in the budget that's going to fund next construction season, which starts in the spring, we're going to see an increased number in orange barrels. There's no doubt about it. And, and I look forward to those complaints. Uh, I look forward to hearing the complaints about road construction in Michigan, uh, because that means we're making progress. Talk about progress. Talk about you as a speaker. Term limits has created a very interesting circumstance around here. The last person who occupied this office had been in office and seasoned exactly two years before they became speaker. You've had four years, so by comparison, you're an old timer. But in leadership, after only four years in the House, now the advantage is that nobody else, it's not like there are people out there with 20 years' experience. What kind of a learning curve is that for you to take uh, control 
of a majority that, as you point out, has a big, broad range of ideas about the way things should be accomplished, and trying to make that a cohesive group to get the priorities that you can all identify that you agree with passed, given that there are people that will say, well, wait a minute, I've got to go back for a primary next year, and if I vote for this, somebody further to the right of me is going to say that I'm, you know, for taxing or spending or whatever the, the, the argument is. What kind of a curve is that to control that? It, it was once uh, described to me as herding minnows. <laughs> you know, there's certainly a, certainly a curve. And, you know, there's not a lot of time to get yourself ready in, in light. I and mean, this is just the system that we have now. And, and so I don't complain about it. I accept it and do the best that I can with the time that I have. And, and um, I openly admit I, I'm learning and continuing to get better every day, I feel. Uh, you know, from a strategy standpoint, uh, from knowing exactly where the buttons are that you push to get things done, um, from, you know, building the trust in relationships. That's one of the biggest things that has been set back here by the limited amount of time that we have is just to be able to build that trust in those relationships uh, to get things done. But, you know, as to, as to the point about when concerns rise about, you know, how is this going to affect me? You mentioned about, you know, future elections and things of that nature. I mean, my philosophy has been, well, I would say a couple things. One has been that good policy is good politics. You know, if we focus on good policy, uh, the politics are going to play themselves out well. I've found, you know, I've been here now five years. And we've taken some tough votes uh, over that time, make no bones about it. And I'm proud of those votes. And, and it takes courage to cast those votes. But what I've found is the public respects those and will get behind those that are willing to make themselves vulnerable and, and cast those tough votes if they're done for the right reasons. And so I find when I go back to the district, when I'm in other members' district, as long as you explain yourself and, and explain to the people why you did what you did, um, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to be uh, receptive to that, you know. Uh, but to the extent that we don't make ourselves available or we don't make it clear why we did what we did, then, then the natural, uh, you know, natural response is going to be one of, of question. But I think, again, you know, good policy is good politics. To that end, it's not just roads that you've been getting done in the House. Uh, you also just recently, the governor just signed uh, some education changes, the way that things go, including third grade reading and I think some teacher evaluation, some of that. Talk to me a little bit about what you've done uh, as a group, as a body uh, on education, because some of those were more bipartisan bills, if I'm not mistaken. You know, they were, and I think, uh, you know, the, the bill on third grade reading or the package on third grade reading, I think, is, is so critical. And, and I think there's a... Um, an understanding in the public or a belief in the public that you know Rhodes has just created this dam and everything is piled up behind it and that may be true to some regard but we've been able to get a lot of things done here in recent uh, you know recent uh, weeks and months and third grade reading is one that I'm very interested uh, you know very proud of uh, what that is about in in you know it was getting some I think unfair spin uh, as to what it's all about but what it's about is it's uh, an attempt to try to raise our reading proficiency in the state uh, at the end of third grade we have numbers that we should be embarrassed of we have numbers that uh, far too many young people are not reading at grade level uh, at the end of the third grade. And third grade is a period that's looked at, um, and I think there's pretty broad consensus around the fact that if a child is not reading proficiently by the end of the third grade, that sets them back the whole rest of their learning years. And so there's a saying, you know, uh, that up until the end of third grade that you're um, learning to read in the time beyond, you're reading to learn. And so what we said was, okay, what are we going to do to try to change this? Because the results are not there. And so what this third grade reading package does is it, it says, okay, from the very earliest years, you know, looking at first grade, we're going to have evaluations. We're going to see where kids are reading at. And to the extent that they're not proficient at that point, we'll have a system of intervention so that we can get them the extra, uh, extra time with instructors that's needed to, to get up to grade level. And then ultimately, at the very end of the third grade, if there's not uh, proficiency, uh, then there's an opportunity for some summer intervention. And then if a child is still not just proficient, but if they are still a full grade level behind, then at that point there's retention. Because if we haven't gotten it right first grade, second grade, third grade, all these interventions, and they're still over a full grade behind, we don't do that student any favors by promoting them on. And, and we're seeing the ill effects of that across the state. And it's not just in, in certain districts. Uh, our numbers are not where they, where they should be in much of the state. And so I think that that is something that, you know, that's a vote that I would point to too, kind of leading back to the other question about a contentious issue at times, and it's not exactly uh, politically expedient because you're not going to see the results tomorrow. This is the type of change that you make and you're going to see the changes 
over a generation, you know, over a long period of years as these children come of age and are entering the job market and, and things of that nature. So, um, you know, those are the types of bills I would look at, you know, third grade reading. I'd look at road funding. I'd look at some other big initiatives like this and say those are the types of things that it feels so good to accomplish when you do it right and you say there's something that's going to far outlast, far outlive my time here in Lansing. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday night, you were in the governor's office, one floor up and halfway down the Capitol. I wasn't in there, although I watched as the governor and the Senate Majority Leader and you talked about this Rhodes Bill. Was that a moment that you were able to say, I'm going to check this box, you've already described the plan, you've already said you think it is the plan, but I'm going to check this box and now I don't have to worry about that part of it, there are other priorities I can look at. Because as you just pointed out, not everything had come to a stop in Lansing, but it was occupying a heck of a lot of your time and the governor's time, Senate Majority Leader's time. Was that a moment that you could say, okay, that one's out of the way, we can move on? You know, I, I think so. Um, and, and I think while the road funding piece has been addressed, and there are some really good reforms in there as well to make sure that we're very, you know, being uh, as efficient as possible in the way we're spending, competitive bidding, warranties, things of this nature, I think that we can still tweak that going forward. Not to make changes to the funding model, but rather are there other things that we can do in the way of efficiencies, in the way of, you know, making sure that we're using the best materials and these things. So I think that we'll continue to work on that over time. But the urgent piece about the funding, uh, that's there and that's going to come in. Um, but as to the issue being behind us, I mean, we spent so much time on it uh, that, you know, I think there's a natural thought of what are you going to do with all your time now? And I can tell you that void is filled so quickly. I think some of the issues, you know, in the queue right now, uh, one is energy policy. Uh, what are we going to do uh, to, to address some of the energy um, really, I would call them emergencies that are facing Michigan right now, you know, as a result of some change that come down at the federal level from the EPA, uh, we're going to have a situation where nine coal burning power plants in Michigan are going to be going offline. Uh, so what are we going to do to fill that void? So these are some of the things that uh, quickly fill that void. Uh, there won't be any downtime. It's just on to the next issue or issues. And, and those include that, plus perhaps uh, auto no fault reform. There's an issue about Detroit public schools. All of those things are coming up, which leaves me with my final question. I know it's not a perfect question and it won't be a perfect answer because we, we don't know for sure. You come through a big issue like this, you go through all those quadrant meetings, you get down to what you think is a deal, then it's not a deal, but you still have to work with your neighbor across the hall and with the, the folks on the other side of the aisle. Do you just come out compartmentalize? Do, you, do both sides just say, okay, that's over and now we can work together on this? Or do you have to rebuild? You know, I try to try to separate it. Um, I, I try in situations wherever possible to take the emotion out of it. Let's focus on facts. Let's focus on, you know, getting the next thing done. Um, you know, because as I said, the bickering, uh, I'm going to defend myself, but I'm not going on the offense on the attacks. Uh, but that's not productive time. Whether you're going on the attack or you're defending, it's not a good use of time. I have a limited amount of time. Uh, I have um, you know, 13 months and change uh, here, and I think every day about what am I going to do with the limited amount of time that I have? How can I get as much of the agenda done that I want to accomplish? And so I really don't have time for the attacks. You know, I mean, it's something I look forward uh, to the time, not that I'm rushing it, but when I am out of office to look back and kind of reflect on all of these things that uh, you, know, you can't uh, completely dwell on uh, while you're going through them because if you do, we're just going to spin our wheels and we're going to lose that momentum. We have a tremendous amount of momentum right now and still a lot of things that we want to tackle. And so I just look forward to that. As I've said several times in this program, Democrats have a much different view of the Rhodes deal that was passed in Lansing this past week. And you'll hear their points of view on this show in coming weeks. We'll also talk about some other important activities from this week when we come back to the point. Finally, on this morning's program, there was an election this week. In fact, there were several elections for bonds, millages, and three special elections for the State House. One in Grand Rapids because of the resignation of Brandon Dillon. He's now the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party. One in the 82nd District in Lapeer and one in the 80th District in Allegan because of those two lawmakers, Gamrat and Corser, who ran afoul of their colleagues in the House. Gamrat was expelled, Corser resigned. They both ran for their offices again, and we're both soundly defeated. There'll be a special election in March to decide who finally goes to Lansing. We're back next week to the point.